Good evening, the Secretary of Soul Sharing Psalms and Hymns will turn to page 1364. Page 364, we'll sing 1, 2, and 4. Page 364. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing on the promises Standing on the promises I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling swords of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises. Standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, I'm standing on the promises of God. Song is here to be page 327. 327 again, we'll sing 1, 2, and 4. Page 327. Sing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay Where doubts arise and fears dismay Though some may dwell where these abound My prayer, my aim is higher ground Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost high and catch a glimpse of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift.
lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land a higher plane than I have found Lord plant my feet on higher ground Amen. last song this evening is page number four page number four we sing all three verses we go home by the way of the cross there's no other way but this I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss the way of the cross leads home the way of the cross leads home it is sweet to Knees go on in the blood sprinkled way, the path that the Savior trod. If I ever climb to the heights of black, where the soul is at home with God, the way of the cross leads home. The way leads home it is sweet to know as I onward go the way of the cross leads home then I bid farewell to the way of the world to walk in it never for my Lord says, come, and I seek my home, where he waits at the open door. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. Amen. It's good to be in the Lord's house on this midweek service. We, uh, it seems like even as we come out of the holiday weekend that the week just kind of flying by here, but, um, you know, the Lord has for us what He wants us to be able to gain out of His Word, and uh, truly that's a blessing in itself. I hope those that may be watching could uh, uh, be with us at times to be able to be in the Lord's house and and see His uh, His blessings as we go through His Word. We uh, we look at the we get into Ephesians. We are in chapter number three. And we went through verse 9 uh, Sunday evening, and uh, we pick up in verse 10, you know, in and through uh, the verses here in, as he began chapter 3, he uh, is revealing unto them some things that they, they need to know that literally... Uh, they ought to know some things about. And he picks up with, in verse 10 and 11, we find 
uh, his purpose or their purpose, it says, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which He proposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we, he, He's beginning to tell them and to, to inform them upon God's purpose. You know, it is God's purpose to make this uh, multifaceted wisdom of the Gospel and for it to be made known through the local New Testament church. He's telling them it's not only for them, but it is for them to be able to tell others. So just as it is, that's the main principle of the local New Testament church today. We are to learn, and by learning we can uh, improve and incorporate it into our worship and our prayers and as we seek the Lord's guidance and His will in our lives, and then by that, we can go out and take those things to a lost and dying world. So that they too might come and under and, uh, and into the very place of blessing that I hope every born-again believer finds himself. We look and we might be surprised as to the audience of this declaration of truth and wisdom. Uh, we find that it is the rulers and, in th and the authorities in the heavens. If we look at verse 10, it says, To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places. So, as we look at this, you know, Biblical commentators, they kind of uh, differ as to the specific composition of this audience and whether it's made up of good angels or evil angels or both. But Peter, when, uh, when speaking about God's great salvation, said that angels long to get a glimpse of these things. There in 1 Peter 1 and verse 12. You know, we will find that when we reach heaven, that the angels there in heaven will have to take a back seat to the redeemed. They were made the way they were made. And we, on the other hand, chose to love our Creator. So they'll have to take a back seat to the redeemed. You know, Paul also described uh, wisdom here in these verses as being uh, withheld from uh, demonic forces for a time leading to the cruci uh, crucifixion of Jesus according to 1 Corinthians 2 verse 6-8. And we know this is true because even with uh, uh, the man that had all of the uh, deem, demonic spirits within him by the name of Legion, they even spoke to Jesus, these demonic spirits, and said, what do you have to do with us? Now, if they had, already, if they had an understanding or had uh, the, uh, to know the reason of these things, they wouldn't have asked Jesus anything. And secondly, they surely would not have thought that they had won when they crucified our Lord. They would have been shaking in their, uh, in their boots uh, knowing that their end is very short-lived or is coming. We look and uh, in and through these things certainly if demons understood the power that the resurrection would have to defeat them they would not have wanted to crucify the Lord in the first place 
But they thought if they could kill him, kill the man, they could kill the purpose. But they were wrong. Verse 11, we find our proclamation of the gospel before people and heavenly beings is God's eternal purpose. Verse 11 says, according to the eternal purpose which He proposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, the theme of uh, is God's eternal purpose and the theme about which Paul wrote to the Ephesians. It's always has been God's plan to use the church to make known the good news of the gospel or salvation. If it wasn't, then every time that a person, a sinner gets saved, they'd be taken from this world and be placed up into up in heaven. But we are left here to propagate the gospel. God didn't only propose to bring us back to Himself through Christ's sacrifice for our sins. He also desires that we become His instruments of grace to others. God desires the salvation of all people with intensely equal to His passion that would become, that would come into fellowship with Him through Christ. So the next time that we share the Gospel with another person, we ought to be able to, to say to ourselves with all truthfulness, I was made and saved to do this, which is to tell somebody about Jesus. You know, if not, then our job when we got saved would be over. But on the other hand, when we get saved and we become this a new creation in Christ Jesus is instrument by which God is going to propagate the gospel to a lost and dying world, then you know we, we turn around then and our work isn't over, it's just beginning. So in this he you know that is our eternal purpose. Verse 12 says, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith, by the faith of Him. We have a boldness in sharing the faith is not always characteristics of the body of Christ. There are many believers who are timid. They are fearful about having gospel conversations with lost people. The word boldness, it literally means uh, freedom of speech. This confidence is grounded in our confident access to approach God the Father. You know, we always have the, by, the means by which we can seek His grace, His will, and His help in telling others about Jesus. Before we ever open our mouths to begin discussion with a lost person or someone that we may think may be lost, as we witness to them about the very grace of God, first thing that we ought to do is that we ought to be praying that God would give us exactly what He wants us to tell them. And then tell them. You know, this uh, confidence is grounded in our confident access to approach God. Because of our faith in Christ, we have an intimate relationship with the Lord. And this relationship fuels our witnessing. It strengthens us. It gives us that confidence that we need. Now, does it mean that every time that we go out and we pray about giving the Gospel message out to someone, 
and we do it, that they're automatically going to jump up and, and want us to lead them in a sinner's prayer and get saved. No! Chances are, more times than not, they're not going to want to have anything to do with it. But we never know. It doesn't mean that we sit up here and say, well, golly, I've told five people and none of them have done anything. None of them have come to uh, uh, have gotten saved or asked me to lead them in a sinner's prayer or any of that stuff. And for the truth, at that moment, they may not have. But we don't know how the Holy Spirit works on a person. And He may take them to a place or even in an instant of time in which they may ask questions of somebody else. You know, it's not always... Ours is not always harvest. But at times it is planting. And at other times it's watering. And sometimes we got to do a little weed in the garden. And then there are those times we get to stand in the midst of the harvest. And it just gives us that, that extra little pick up in our step to go forward and continue what we're doing. You know, there we will find that we could be greatly helped by daily devotion rituals and things. Each morning uh, we find that uh, there was a man that each morning he prayed three things. Every morning when he got up he prayed three things. One, for an opportunity to share Christ with someone. Two, for the wisdom to see it. And three, the courage to do it. And you know, maybe that's a pretty good prayer for us. We ought to let our witnessing begin with an intimate relationship with Jesus. The old adage is true. We should talk to Jesus about lost people before we talk to lost people about Jesus. Verse 13. Verse 13 says... Wherefore, or because of what I've just previously said, I desire that ye faint not at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. So when we look at these things, he, you know, he's telling them, you know, don't you worry about me. Paul finds himself at the writing of this letter in prison or in jail. And you know he's telling them, "Hey, I, I'm I'm doing these things for you, but don't don't you worry about me." Paul began chapter three by referencing his imprisonment or his tribulation for the gospel, and then concluded by addressing the subject with his readers. He mentioned to them his uh, tribulations on their part or on their behalf. As he says, for you. He's referring to his Gentile ministry. Perhaps they saw in Paul's difficulty the world's growing hostility toward the gospel. Perhaps we feel the same at times. Watching a culture that is increasingly becoming more hostile to God and His truth. And there, none of that is, is ever more evident than today. The world, the people that we entrust to lead us and to guide us, and we find that it, it, they, it's, more, it's a more growing hostility towards the things of God. Every chance they get, this world would do something that 
is not pleasing to God because they think it's what people want. Well, who really cares what people want? It's what God wants that makes a difference. Perhaps we feel the same watching this culture of ours. Regardless of the reception they found and that we might find, we have great reason to continue faithfully sharing our witness. Rejection and suffering in this world is not the end of the story. Jesus told us we were going to have it. We just need to learn to accept that fact. For there awaits for Christ's own people a glory beyond comprehension. You know, we find here in, in verse 13, it says, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at all of my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Man, don't faint because what I'm doing. Just keep on keeping on what I'm, te- what I'm, I'm instructing you and telling you that you need and that God wants you to be doing. Because if you do, it will be for your glory that you do these things. You know, we we look and uh, as he, he continues in this teaching and, and this letter that he's, he's given them, he, he comes in to, as he prays for them, here as we pick up in verse 14 through 21, he wants them to understand their residency, their residence. God offers believers strength by Christ dwelling in us. He dwells in us in the form of the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes the simple presence of a friend makes all the difference. Most of us appreciate appreciate someone by our side when receiving maybe some serious news or medical test results or some kind of a legal proceeding or something. Strength to do the hard things in life can be found simply through a physical presence of maybe somebody else. Simply, I'll go with you and we'll face this together. Maybe some of the most precious words that we will ever hear. But you know, that's exactly how Christ feels to us. Just let me go with you. You know, I'll stick closer than a brother. You don't have to worry about me falling down or my faith to be with you because I'm going to be there. And we have to, to see these things as we understand, you know, there's always has to be an understand an understanding of the context of things. We find based on the great truth that through his cross, Jesus created a new something brand new especially to the first century church and we and it ought to be something that is shared even in our day to day that through his cross Jesus created a new multiracial community of faith com- 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 comprised of Jews and Gentiles Paul offered a prayer for the Ephesian believers He prayed to the Father to strengthen the Ephesians. The prayers of Paul as inspired Scripture represent more than an example of how an ancient believer prayed. They demonstrate God's plan for every believer. And in this case, they give a description of the new life brought into existence through Jesus Christ. You know, this prayer represents 
clearly what it means to be made alive with Christ that we found back in chapter 2 and verse 5. This presence of Christ in our lives changes everything. With Him, a new life emerges for His glory. After concluding his prayer in chapter 3, Paul begins to set forth the particulars of this new life in Christ. There is an observable pattern in the way that Paul writes. Not just in Ephesians, but in other New Testament letters as well. He frequently begins with doctrine, with truth, with statements of reality, that are grounded in God's redemptive work. In Ephesians, we find these three things in the first three chapters of the book. At the beginning of chapter 4, we will see there is an all-important conjunction of therefore that marks the beginning. And it marks the transition from doctrine to practice. You know, it, it's kind of like uh, you know, we it's kind of like uh, ball teams. All right? they, they practice all week so that the plan that they have developed as they go into their next game against their next uh, opponent and they they develop it, they develop it, they practice it, they practice it and then on game day they put what they practiced into works. The same as it is with us. You know the very uh the very uh, transition from doctrine to practice from the indicative or already true to the imperative waiting to be made true state. It reminds us of that which distinguishes Christian faith from all other religions. It is God-centered. Not sourced in what human beings can do to merit salvation especially the lifestyle of a follower of Jesus, is a reverent response to what God has already graciously done. Not an attempt to reach God through any kind of human effort or right kind of behavior. So when we look at this, we find verse 14 and 15, it says, For this call, I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So we find that because of their status as the people of God, the church, this the one new man created through the cross of Christ, Paul prayed for the Ephesians. No doubt he was motivated to do so because of what he had previously affirmed. That believers have access to God there in verse 12. So in this way we see the important connection between instruction and devotion, between Bible study and prayer. Both are vital in our growth as followers of Jesus. From Paul's perspective, It was not enough to teach the Ephesians. He also felt impressed to pray for them. Information was important, but but an openness of heart to receive this truth now is critical. You can tell all you want to somebody, but if their heart's not going to be open to receive it, then... 
you know, it, it's not going to do anything. Paul, this teaching that he's trying to get across to them, he wants them, he, he, he understands that it's not only the knowledge that he's given them, but they have to open their hearts to receive this knowledge so that as they walk and as they live their lives, then they can apply this doctrinal, this knowledge to their lives. The same as us today. We should take note that although Paul was under severe limitations in his prison cell, he could still pray for others. The adversary may stop us from doing many things through persecution or trials, troubles, whatever the case is. Our own physical bodies may hinder us from doing some things at times. But as long as we have life, and as long as we have breath, we can pray. Nothing can prevent us from lifting up others unto the Father. We strengthen others by praying for them. Paul's reference to the Father prompted him to state a particular application of this divine characteristic. Every family derives its existence from Him. And there in verse 15, He says, Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The meaning here is not so much that we might call the nuclear family, but rather the sense of a group of people who have a common existence or a common ancestor. We can see that it is family in a broader sense because it isn't restricted to the earth, but also in heaven. It is a very comprehensive view of families that Paul had in mind here. His point was that every family Every group, every clan, every ethnic, uh, uh, ethnicity originated with God the Father and the Creator. He created all things, including all people, all races, and things. He wants them to realize. And he, and he tells them, here in verse 16, he says, uh, well, verse 15 says, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, verse 16, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might, with might by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. So as we look in this, we find He's now addressing this indwelling that they have to comprehend. Now, to them, they're thinking, you know, Alright, uh, here we are. We, uh, we, uh, in my faith, I trust Jesus as, as Lord and Savior. I know that it's my, it's my job that I'm sp supposed to be telling others and witnessing and all these things. But how am, I supposed, how am I supposed to do it? I don't fully comprehend. Well, now Paul's telling them that you are able to do it because of the indwelling of Christ within you. And that's called the Holy Spirit. He gives us the strength in order to do these things. The familiar 
to avoid vague prayers and instead to pray specific prayers is evident in Paul's example. He shared with the Ephesians four specific requests of his prayer for them. Spiritual growth, abiding faith, awareness of God's love, and the fullness of God. Each of these objectives merit merit our study and contemplation. We can see in Paul's prayer an example to emulate. First off, we see in his kneeling. Up in verse 14, he he says, he literally uh, tells them, for this cause I bow my knees. There is humility before God. We ought to feel a humility, a humbleness before God. Next, Paul called on God as Father. Again, there in verse 14, he says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father. Which is expressing an intimate relationship with the one who gave him life. Finally, this man of God recognized that prayer was not so much claiming something from him as it was receiving what his father chose to give him or to grant him. And this rightly expresses the humility required to come before God in prayer. See, these things are what are what Paul knew, but he was expressing to them that now they might know it as well. What Paul specifically asked God to grant to the Ephesians was that they would be strengthened. Verse 16 says that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory or His grace to be strengthened with the might of His Spirit in the inner man. You know, His desire was that they would be strengthened with power inwardly. This divine empowerment in our inner being is only done and only provided one way, through the Spirit. There is an obvious contrast of the inner being with the physicality of our existence. Now, we can be here and we may have physical strength to do something. But at times, it takes the inner strength to call upon our physical strength or to cause upon our physical strength doing. This right expresses the humility required to come to Him. We see that even when the externals of our existence are in peril, believers have an inner life on which to rely. So there could there could a lot of people I, I think they they don't they don't understand the inner strength that it takes to die now there'll be times sure people say, well, what about a car? They're killed instantly. You know, whatever. True. But there are times when we have to rely on what is on the inside of us when it comes time to leaving this physical world. And trust in that. I mean, you know, it's one thing to know in your mind that 
you know, one of these days, I'm going to die. Unless the rapture comes back first. But, you know, one of these days I'm going to die. Well, and true. We might. But in order to accept those things and to have the comfort of knowing where you're going and who you're going to get to see and what's going to transpire, man, that comes from within us. We don't have that in our physicality of us. But it comes from within us. You know, as every born-again believer, when it comes time to die, we, we ought not be afraid to die. Every man is going to go through it, basically. And, but the trouble is, we can rely on what is inside of us to help us in that transition and those around us. Now I know people that would, you know, they they want everything, whatever man can do to keep them alive, you know. No matter how they end up or whatever. And all that does, I mean, that doesn't help your family or your loved ones. You know? So I think that we would be better to rely on that that's within us so that we can even comfort those that may be around us when the end comes. You know, this is where on the inside of us when there's things come up that we have to recall, we have to relive, we have to go inside of us that we experience and encounter Christ in our, in, within us. The degree to which we can do so is in accordance to the very riches of His glory. How are we able to do that? How are we able to have a, a confidence in, in going through something or, or even in our dying? Well, it's through the riches of God's glory. It's how we, we are able to go through these things and to approach them in that type of a manner. Sure, probably none of us want to go. I'm not afraid of going. And if it be whatever God desires, then so be it. The more we grasp His greatness, the more we will experience His power. We look in the very first part of verse 17 that says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That He could indwell by faith. This request that Christ may dwell in your hearts does not express a desire by Paul that the Ephesians might be saved. But what we're getting here, they, this is, they're already saved. The Greek word for dwell carries the idea of abiding, of living somewhere for the long period of time. It describes the experience of a familiar relationship with Christ. Not one characterized by long periods of silence and isolation. Christ's desire for us is that this indwelling since it occurs in the inner being of a person, be active and sustaining. It ought to be something that we could draw strength from and we could draw confidence from, even in the worst times of our lives. 
we're going to stop there. We still got to, still got to do the prayer bulletin. So I hope that, you know, as we look in these things, this is what Paul was hoping to get across to them. Why, even while he's in prison in Rome. So we find, uh, as we do, I hope that those that are watching may have gained uh, that their heart was open to this as well. Remember our prayer list. You don't need to pre particularly know what's on it. Just be sure and pray for it. The Lord knows what it is. And until next time, we'll see.